The, the name of the company is Van Gold Mining. But uh, we have announced that as of tomorrow morning, our company and our shares are going to be trading as Guanajuato Silver Company. Uh, obviously, we're very excited about that change. And Guanajuato Silver better reflects the nature of the company and what we're doing. Um, Guanajuato is a famous old Mexican mining town. Um, and we are active there. And I'll tell you all about that. And we're go we are going to be producing silver and gold in the fourth quarter of this year. Um, and uh, silver will be the primary metal that we'll be producing. So we felt, felt that having Guanajuato silver, having silver in the name of the company uh, was going to be helpful as well. And I guess one last thing is that Guanajuato being an, an old famous mining camp, um, it is ripe for consolidation. And I, having the name of the company Guanajuato silver, uh, I think focuses people in the, in the direction that we want to go, which is to be a consolidator of mining assets in that region. Uh, also, we, we will be trading under the symbol GSVR. So if you want to keep track there tomorrow morning and see how the stock continues to uh, to do, uh, I encourage you to do that. I will be making a number of forward-looking statements, so please be cautious about that. Uh, I'm going to going to try to frame the, the presentation here this morning for people who maybe don't know too much about Van Gold and about the journey that we've had over the last year or so in getting to the place that we are. Um, and then I'll tell some people, um, you know, a little bit about what some of our future plans are as well. Um, six months to production is what we like to highlight on this particular slide. And uh, I do like to talk about that. Um, in our business these days, people like to brag about being three years or five years even to production. We have a ready mill that uh, is hungry for additional material. Um, we are refurbishing that mill currently. That And that's that's from a transaction that we did with Endeavor Silver, buying the El Cubo mine and milling operation, um, something that we closed in April of this year. But we're about six months away from production, less now, more like four months. I was just in Guanajuato for three weeks, up until a couple of weeks ago. And I can tell you that the team there is adamant that by the fourth quarter, we will be putting material through the mill. Uh, a seven year mine life with our PEA. So when we bought um, El Cubo from Endeavor Silver, now, there were a lot of people who thought, well, the resources there must be um, dried up. Um, Bear Dole Bear, the, the, the US-based uh, engineering firm, did a PEA for us. And I can tell you there is ample material there. And they phrase the, uh, the whole PEA um, looking at a seven-year mine life with indicated and inferred mixed together. I know we're not supposed to do that exactly, but um, broadly speaking, about 27 million um, ounces of silver equivalent. A dedicated management team, I'll come to that towards the end of the presentation about you know who we are and, and all of the, the quality people, mostly Mexicans, who have been drawn towards the, this these sets of assets and this company over the last little while. And I do want to mention Guanajuato. Of course, we're going to proudly wear that as our name, as our moniker now. But Guanajuato has a, a long-lived, storied 480-year mining life. Um, there were there was Spanish people smart enough to figure out that there's high grade silver and gold there within 60 years of Columbus sailing. So I think that really says a lot. But also Guanajuato is a it's a beautiful city. Uh, it's a city of about 150,000 people in the state of Guanajuato. Um, it is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So if you go down into the old town area, it's kind of like walking around an old town in in uh, Spain or or in Italy. Um, there's good restaurants, there's cafes, parks. It's a, it's a lovely place, and it's one of the reasons why we can attract so many quality people to the company to work there. Uh, the lifestyle uh, affords itself to be able to, to draw very good people to the, to the company. Um, you can see the um, regulatory halt for our uh, fundamental transaction from the, um, the venture exchange. Um, so through that period of time when the stock wasn't trading, we raised about 17 million Canadian dollars in equity. Uh, the stock came back to trade when we closed the, uh, the transaction with Endeavor Silver, and people have been enjoying uh, this story and, and what our plans are to refurbish this mill and be Mexico's next silver producer by the fourth quarter. Currently, we've got a little bit uh, over $7 million in the treasury, and we'll be commenting on our financial position in a news release that, that further announces the name change at the close of business today. Um, we have, uh, in just the last couple of weeks, announced a, uh, a closing 
uh, at least the paper closing of a silver and gold loan for seven and a half million US dollars. That number translates into a little over nine million Canadian dollars. So in total, uh, corrected to Canadian dollars on this slide, we will have access to about 16 million Canadian dollars in order to refurbish the, the mill and do whatever development work is necessary to begin mining in the fourth quarter. Um, just one other, or a couple of other points about the silver and gold loan. So the way that this works, this is a, a, um, a transaction that we've done with a, a European family office who has offices in, in Geneva and Paris. Uh, we will draw down on a date of our choosing within the next 90 days, seven and a half million US dollars. On that day, we will make note of where the price of gold and silver have closed in London uh, and then take a 15% discount from that. We get a six month grace period where we do not have to pay back anything. And then we pay back the loan in 12 equal monthly installments in silver and gold based on that known silver and gold price when we draw down the money. So, um, you know, obviously there's a, there's a discount to the price of gold and silver at that time. That's how our friends in Europe make their money. But there's no other attendant fancy early drawdown, extra payments, warrants, bonus shares, there's none of that stuff. It's a simple loan repayable in silver and gold after that six month grace period. So for us, um, you know, we think that that works really well. And in fact, if you look at the strength in the price of silver and gold over the last 90 day period, I can make the argument that if you take the, if you use as a denominator, the price of silver and gold 90 days ago, we're not actually paying any interest for the loan. So we think that it works very well for us, and that's the kind of the nuts and bolts about uh, getting that additional money. So who are our shareholders? Uh, after the transaction with Endeavor Silver, Endeavor becomes our largest share shareholder. So we gave them a block of shares, which at the time equated to five million US dollars worth of our shares as part of the 15 million US dollar purchase price of El Cubo. So they end up with about 11% of our, of our company. Myrmican is a Connecticut-based silver and gold precious metals fund uh, controlled by Dan Oliver. Uh, Dan is also on our board of directors, so very supportive, very helpful. Uh, Dan and I have been friends for about eight years or so, and he's been instrumental in the, in the success so far of Van Gold and certainly will be um, of Guanajuato Silver. Uh, other directors of the company. Um, own about 7% of the company, and that, that a large portion of that is, is me. Uh, VBS is a family office from Australia. They are sometimes billed as Australia's wealthiest family. Uh, they've also just, uh, over the last couple of years, put a gold mine back into production in Australia. So they do have a team of, um, uh, of mining experts that can do a deep dive on situations like ours, which they have done, and they are comfortable and happy owning currently about 5% of the company. Uh, and then there's a fellow named Eric Sprott, who they tell me also knows a great deal about mining. And uh, he participated in the last private placement as well. So it's uh, always it's always great to have Eric on board and being supportive of, of what you're doing. Um, here is a couple of pictures of what we bought from Endeavor. So it's called El Cubo. Here you get a good look at the office complex, the mill complex, uh, where the trucks come in to dump the ore. And on your right-hand side is a picture of the mill that I took in November when we were there with Bear Dole Bear. And you can see the mill itself is in excellent shape. Uh, Endeavor Silver closed this mill in November of 2019. That is when silver prices were about $16. But it goes a little bit further than that, uh, you know, because I get the question all the time, well, why would Endeavor part company with this? Um, just to put the whole thing into perspective, Endeavor paid 200 million US dollars for this asset in 2012. They paid 100 million US dollars in cash and 100 million dollars in their shares. We, on the other hand, pay 15 million US dollars for it in total, and that includes the, uh, the block of shares that we've given to Endeavor. From Endeavor's perspective, what they were trying to do, they not only paid 200 million dollars for it, but they spent 30 or $40 million on the mill and expanded El Cubo to the point, I think, of its inefficiency. So you can build a 1,500-ton-a-day mill, which is what this is, but the mine itself, though an excellent asset and though 
an asset that has been producing on and off, but mostly on for about 200 years. It is a typical central Mexican epithermal system. The veins are a meter or a meter and a half wide. They're good grade, but they're narrow. And so trying to develop 1,500 tons per day from this asset was very difficult over the years for our friends at Endeavor. They decided that it would, that it would not move the needle for a over a billion dollar market cap company at this point. And therefore they were looking around for it for a purchaser. For us, in combination with our other assets in the area, especially El Penguico, which is only about five kilometers in a straight line from Kubo, and it's about eight kilometers maybe by road. So the combination of the two assets, what we're able to do is not run the mill at 1500 tons a day, but rather run it at 750 tons a day. Moreover, we'll be taking material both from El Cubo and from Pinguico. And in that way, we feel that we can be a little smaller, but very profitable and nimble right from the get-go. So let me go on. Let me just discuss the, um, the resources that we have in front of us. This is from our PEA, again, that was done by Bear Dole Bear just a few months ago. Um, this is a resource from our El Pinguico asset, which again is just five kilometers away in a straight line from El Cubo. Um, Bear Dole Bear did not give us very much credit for some of the material that we have at Pinguico. And I'll, I'll discuss that a little bit further when we, when we get to, and to the slides on Pinguico. But most of the material that, that we see in sight that's good grade, readily available, is at El Cubo. Uh, because it's a PEA, all of the material ends up either in an indicated or an inferred category. However, I will say that, you know, if a different study was made, um, a, a, at least some of the material, let's say the first year's worth of material, would end up being in the measured or even in the reserve category. Some of the material has been blasted already by Endeavor and remains unmucked at the bottom of, a, of an open stope. Uh, when I was there a couple of weeks ago, on several occasions, you know, we got into pickup trucks. It's a big mine. So we got into pickup trucks. You go into the Dolores portal. You can drive for about 25 minutes before you're at the two stopes that we will actively be mining here in the fourth quarter. And again, where you can see, you can see, you know, good grade vein material right in front of you. And we will have ample material to be able to fill up that mill uh, for the next 36 months. That's where our mine plan is being developed and uh, and goes out to right now. And you can also see here, this is good grade material. So I mean, just roughly speaking, it's about 400 grams of silver equivalent. And with silver at 27, 28, uh, God willing, maybe $29 an ounce, we can make very good money on this resource. So this shows everything in blue here shows a claim map of all of the claims that we managed to buy from Endeavor in this transaction. So in total, we now have about 7,000 hectares within the Guanajuato area. It makes us the second largest claim holder in the Guanajuato area after Fresnillo. Um, and I, I guess just a couple of other comments on that, you know, for the $15 million that we spend, not only do we buy the mill and the mine, and the resource, but we also get these 7,000 hectares in one of North America's longest lived precious metal camps. I think that in a different marketplace at a different time, just the land package might sell for $15 million. So we're, we're excited about that. We continue to ramp up in our personnel in Guanajuato. Mostly that's focused with mining engineers, metallurgists, process people, getting ready to process material through the mill in the fourth quarter, but we are also adding in a steady way geological help because I feel that the, the way that to, to make this company the most sustainable possible is to continue to explore and to explore um, in a diligent fashion. Um, you know, we, we always hear about aggressive exploration, aggressive drill programs. I would like to take the, the tack of doing this, do, doing exploration more slowly, more thoughtfully, in order to get the best bang out of your exploration dollar. So I want to switch over um, to the Penguico pro project, the Penguico property, uh, again, very close to uh, El Cubo. Penguico has a really cool, interesting, unique history all of its own. 
Uh, it was in production about 110 years ago, and at the time was the highest grade mine in the region, which, you know, it, at that time, I think there were about a dozen different mines that were operating in the region. So that really is saying something. Um, my favorite image up here, the choo-choo train image in black and white, that is from the 1909 annual report of the Penguico Mines Company listed on the New York Stock Exchange. So that's pretty cool. They were making a, a lot of money here, um, you know, for a, a, about a dozen years up until 1913. The violence of the Mexican Revolution at that time made the mostly American group that was um, operating the mine at that time uh, go home. And the thing has never really quite had a chance to get up and running again. You can see on this pay or on this photo in the black and white photo uh, in the top right hand corner a waste pile. And it was waste 110 years ago. You can see a more modern picture. This shot was taken by a drone almost a year ago when uh, we took a thousand tons of this waste material and processed it as a bulk sample through Endeavor Silver's other mill in the area called Bolinitos, which is about 28 kilometers to the north of Penguico. Um, we got a lot of information, a lot of data out of that thousand ton bulk sample and it's, it's information and data that, that is very relevant to our work today. So we were able to, to determine, you know, sampling a, a waste pile is always tricky because you're never really quite sure whether it's gonna be uh, ubiquitous and whether, whether that grade that you, that you find is going to be throughout the whole material. But, but with a thousand ton sample, you get a lot more confidence from that. So with that material, uh, we can be pretty confident that it, it's, that it grades over 100 grams of silver equivalent which is moderate grade, but as you can see, it's sitting on the side of a road. All we really need is a, a front end loader and a 20 ton truck, and we can move the material gingerly the eight kilometers over to our El Cubo mill. So that's important. We also, over just a three day period with the thousand ton bulk sample, we got about 75% um, for recoveries with gold and better than 60% for silver. We think we can do better than that on a, on a go forward on a longer term basis, but over that test, period, over that three-day period, we were very happy to uh, to gain the confidence that this material will float in a flotation mill. Just another look at that, at Penguico. Um, here you can see the above ground stockpile. So that's about 185,000 tons, uh, as I said, at moderate grade. There also, though, is an underground stockpile, which is important as we, as we move towards production. Uh, Hernan Dorado, who's um, one of my partners in Mexico and our chief operating officer, Hernan always likes to say, you know, we, we have to make sure we have enough oxygen to fill the mill while we get the thing back up um, rolling again. And one of the places, obviously, that we can get oxygen is uh, from the 185,000 tons, which is right on surface. But there's also about 150,000 tons underground. Um, first of all, let me just say that, that the underground stockpile was never waste. It was designed as a low-grade stockpile 100 years ago by the miners of the time. So when they weren't mining, when they couldn't mine on, on any daily basis, the 400 tons of really high-grade material, uh, they would draw material from this lower-grade stockpile. Now, lower grade for them is about 300 grams of silver equivalent. So frankly, this is good grade. It's broken ore. We know where it is. All we have to do really is move it to the surface safely, uh, which you know is a bit, bit of an engineering trick. Uh, and then move it on to our, our mill. I call it 150,000 tons. Uh, the Mexican Geological Survey calls it 150,000 tons, and that's from a study that they did in 2012. And internally, our engineers you know, weigh it to about that, um, that amount as well. Our friends at Bear Dole Bear, when they were doing the, um, uh, the PEA, they only gave us credit for about 25,000 tons here. What they said is, well, you can, you can sample it easily entrenching on the top of this stockpile. So that's fine, but sampling the rest of it's tricky. So we're only gonna give you guys credit for the first five meters of this big stockpile, which is fair and I get it. I tried to argue with them for about 10 minutes, but you, you can quickly uh, know when you're not gonna win an argument. So at, at the end of the day, if you go um, to our resource, the Pinguico material only accounts for about 10% of the resource. Um, nonetheless, we feel confident that this material exists. We've already gotten down in this shaft and out 
about 150 meters underneath this level. So we've we've been able to sample this material, and we're we're quite confident that uh, that the grade is ubiquitous. So in terms of additional material at Penguico, this is Penguico is very much an exploration project, and it's it's a kind of a hybrid project because you've got stockpile material that is going to be going into a mill uh, in just the next few months. Um, but from an in situ perspective, it's very much an exploration project and it's very much an exploration project that has never had modern exploration um, applied to it before. So in the, in the fall, what we did for starters is we did a bunch of channel sampling along the number four added level, which portal is right here. You can walk in for 800 meters and then you're on top of that underground stockpile. Um, we did channel sampling all in this area, right near that shaft, which you saw on the, on the other image, um, with an average of about 537 grams of silver equivalent in exposed vein material here. Currently, what we're doing is drilling drill holes from underground, from the San Jose drill station number one, and we'll soon be moving it to drill, hole, drill station number two and drilling back into the vein system in that regard. And here you can see we, we released a first batch of drill results about, about five or six weeks ago now. Um, and again, you know, you're going to have some hits and misses with the first ever modern drill program. But nonetheless, uh, you can see very good grade. It's a narrow system, as is typical in Guanajuato and in central Mexico generally. But the grades are very good. And uh, we think that all of this material over the next number of years will yeah, nothing's easy in the mining business, but I'll, I'll say relatively easily be moved into our into our mill again, which is uh, only eight kilometers by road away. There is a more speculative but big blue sky exploration opportunity at Pinguico. Um, this structure here is called the Veta Madre or the Mother Vein. And the Mexicans have been mining the mother vein in Guanajuato for almost 500 years. It's, they call it the mother vein. It's not really a vein at all. It's a regional fault structure that has been impregnated by a very long-lived and powerful epithermal system. Over the centuries, they've taken about 2 billion ounces of silver out of this structure. So this mother vein structure was mined directly adjacent to us by Fresnillo from 1972 until 2002. 2002, we had $4 silver. Fresnillo went away. The mill that they were using um, is, pardon me, is still there. Um, and it's been used on and off by different people over the, over the last number of years. This structure, though, was mined to within 250 meters of our claim boundary. So... Do I think that that structure carries on onto the Penguico claim boundary? I do. I believe that. So did the people in 1906. There were a series of geological reports written in 1906 about Penguico in favor of the New York Stock Exchange listing, just as we do 43101s, you know, in order to get stock, stock exchange approval today. They had a, a similar process back then. Here you see uh, engineer John Church discussing the situation, identifying the, the surface expression of, um, of Veta Madre about 5,000 feet to the east and that it would dip at about 40 to 45 degrees to the west and onto our property. They did not, though, have the ability, they just didn't have the drilling technology to be able to drill a 500-meter hole and to test this structure. Under normal circumstances, we would have been drilling this already. However, because of the acquisition of the uh, El Cubo assets, we've decided to wait a little while. And principally, if we go back to this slide that shows some of our land package, you can see all of the new land that we've purchased uh, just closing in April. Well, if you, if you look really carefully, you got to squint. I got to get my, my reading glasses on. But there is a tiny little claim right adjacent to Pinguico that comes along with this package. And you know, obviously we knew that we were gonna be buying that a little while ago, but that claim ends up being right about here. So in the months ahead, we're gonna be able to drill from that claim, more shallow holes, maybe for starters, only 250 meter holes into Veta Madre from our property. And then to be able to follow that down 
and gain the confidence to drill the deeper holes where that Veta Madre structure and what they were mining was 25 to 40 meter stopes, where that comes into contact with our narrow but really good grade Pinguico system, that is a cool drill target and we are excited and uh, mm, yes, just excited to be able to drill that and see what happens. Uh, and we'll be doing that in the in the months ahead. So let me let me comment a little bit about some of the people who've been attracted to the uh, to the team. And I'm going to skip ahead to this slide first. Um, one thing that you will notice about the operating team that we've identified: number one, they're almost all Mexican folks. We have in in our mind to make this one of the most Mexican companies operating in in Mexico, one of the most Mexican foreign companies operated in, in Mexico. Uh, you see a lot of Canadian, American, British, Australian companies working down there. They always send their teams from the other countries to run the operations. We will be a little bit different. Hernan Dorado is our chief operating officer. Uh, Hernan and has been a, a director of the company for a number of years. Um, Hernan has worked in Canada at Rainy River. He's worked in Australia. He's worked all over Latin America. Um, but he has come home to Guanajuato where he went to school. The, Guanajuato, the University of Guanajuato is a famous mining school. Hernan's father, Gerardo, also a graduate of the University of Guanajuato and a 44-year experienced mining engineer in Mexico. Um, Filizardo, Antonio, Carlos, Pedro, all with experience at El Cubo. So not only do these folks have experience in Mexico and in the Guanajuato area, but many of them at El Cubo, the operation that we're going to be putting back into production in the fourth quarter. So I think that's very important. I'm going to make one more comment before I uh, open the floor to questions. And that's with our uh, latest addition to the board of directors. And that's Ramon Davila. And I'm going to suggest that Ramon has the best mining CV in Mexico. Ramon was the chief operating, he was on the board of directors and was the chief operating officer of First Majestic for the 10 year period when First Majestic went from having two employees to having 4,000 employees and from going from zero production to having 12 million ounces of silver equivalent production per year. Ramon left that position in 2016 to take on a, a political appointment as the economy secretary for the state of Durango. Um, in just last June, Ramon decided, like every good miner, Ramon decided that he had had enough with politics and he wanted to get back into the mining business. Ramon and Gerardo, that's Hernan's dad, went to school together years ago and have had kind of you know parallel careers. Um, Hernan calls Ramon uncle, so it's that kind of family uh, relationship that Ramon comes into, which is very important in Mexico. Um, I can't say enough about Ramon's impact to the company. You would think that he would be able to give us really good advice about mining and, and metallurgy and you know, how to get the, uh, the El Cubo operation up and running. But uh, just being on the board of directors for a couple of months, he also gives fantastic advice regarding corporate governance and marketing and financing. Uh, he's a he's a, a real giant in the Mexican mining space, and he's going to be he already is, but will become more and more a very important element of what Guanajuato Silver becomes. So uh, all of that having been said, um, I'm going to um, bring this to a close by saying we also have a board of or an advisory board. Uh, that uh, comprises Tuki Angus, John Bedreski, and Greg Hawkins. I get excellent advice from those guys. And um, do we have any questions? We certainly do, James. Thank you. That was a great presentation. And I have to say, it's always great to hear from a company that believes in investing in the communities where they operate. So thank you for sharing some of the history uh, in Mexico. And uh, we'll move on to uh, quite a list of questions that have come in. So we're going to start off with... Um, First question would be, um, understanding the production will begin with lower grade ore to ramp up. How do you see ore sourcing occurring in the first 12, say to 18 months and a blend of different sources? Yeah, okay, so a uh, great question. Um, you know, when, when we first got El Cubo, our, you know, our brains were on, on the track of, well, we've got this stockpile material right on surface. Mm -hmm. Let's just use that. That'll be our, our feed for the first 12 months. Um, 
However, there's better grade that's readily available at El Cubo. Okay. Um, there's there's you know ample material. Um, so within the first six months, we will be able to ramp up so that El Cubo is at least half of the the twenty two thousand five hundred ton a day monthly capacity that we hope to hit going forward. Mark, I'll I'll, I'll make one more comment on that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have a mill that is capable of going fifteen hundred tons a day. We don't want to exhaust our ready our readily available material. Uh, that's too often done with these narrow vein systems. Mm -hmm. There is, however, all kinds of different opportunities within the Guanajuato area, um, old tailings facilities, stranded small deposits that are available and, and we can do business on. And my business partners in, in Mexico, um, they have a better angle on doing good deals with local people mm -hmm. than, than some foreign guy that looks like me. So I'm going to leave leave the, a lot of that business, those business dealings, to my partners in Mexico, who you know who have proven to be very capable at doing that sort of thing. Appreciate the insight there. Thanks, James. Uh, speaking of El Cubo, the question comes in that says, "Are you still scheduled to return to production at El Cubo in the fall?" Yes, okay. uh, I was. I was, as I said, I was there for three weeks up until a couple of weeks ago, and then um, the socialist utopia that we live in here in Canada. Uh, demanded that I spend 14 days in quarantine. Mm -hmm. uh, nonetheless, three weeks in Guanajuato, and uh, you know, I mean, all all joking aside, I asked everybody every day. So fourth quarter, yes, yeah, or like, are we there? Are we like what? What are the what are the gating items? What are the things that we're not that we can't do? And I think we've got a good handle on it. Um, we the, the only long longish lead item is a tertiary crusher that we that we need to buy. We've identified two. Uh, one of them's in Mexico City, which we we hope to transact, you know, very well within days. Uh, that should be on site within the next, you know, 10 days, two weeks. Um, that's it. Everything else, it's more of a maintenance project than anything else. We have to buy hoses and belts and ball bearings and uh, ball mill liners. None of that is difficult to acquire. None of it's rocket science to apply. Uh, so the, the the answer is yes. By the fourth quarter, we will be putting material through that mill. Okay. Thanks for the clarity on that, James. Uh, moving over to questions around output and finance. We have a question here that says, right sizing the mill to the mine and running the mill at half capacity, how does that affect operating costs? Well, on a per ton basis, the costs will go up. Mm -hmm. On a per ounce basis, I think the costs will go down. Okay. Um, you know, and I, 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 I always, I'm, a, I'm just sensitive a little bit about, uh, you know, I, I don't want to poke any fingers at, uh, at Endeavor. Mm -hmm. uh, Endeavor Silver uh, have been just fantastic partners on this. Um, in, in Mexico, well, here in Vancouver uh, also, but especially in Mexico, uh, their team, uh, very supportive about helping us getting back going. They're our largest shareholder. However, I think Endeavor, you know, didn't approach El Cubo the way that it should. I think that operating the thing on a smaller basis, that's what the mine is. Mm. Um, so on a, I'm kind of circling around to the, the back to the question, I guess, um, our, our costs on a per ton basis will be higher, mm -hmm. but if the grade is just naturally higher, our costs on a per ounce basis should be lower. And we will use all of the uh, excellent Mexican narrow vein mining techniques and experience. We'll do resu mining, um, limited cut and fill, much less mechanized mining that was going on uh, under w with Endeavor, where they were, you know, often often doing four meter stopes on a meter and a half vein. And I just, you know, that that doesn't work very well. Understood. Thank you for the clarity there. A uh, question from Peter says, if uh, if Guanajuato Silver could lock down significant amounts of third party stranded silver gold deposits within a few ten to th a few tens of kilometers from your mill, would you run El Cubo at full capacity, say 1500 TBD? So uh, there's a real balance and there's a, there's ongoing discussions internally about where our sweet spot is for that. Mm -hmm. And the 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 gating item on the, the other end is uh, tailings capacity. Currently, we've got about four years worth of tailings capacity, mm -hmm. and you know we, we all we are already on it in terms of expansion of that. There is another tailings facility that's already been partially engineered by Wood Engineers. 
Um, we know we know where we can locate that. We know what the costs are. Mm -hmm. um, getting approvals for it. You know that like everywhere in the world these days, that's your major gating item. We also have a number of other uh, ideas about how we can augment that. But um, so the, the answer to the question is, I think that somewhere in the 1,000, 1,100, 1,200 ton a day capacity, that's where our sweet spot is so that we don't run out of tailings uh, capacity to orbit. Uh, I see. Uh, great. Thank you for that logic. A uh, question comes for clarity around the name change, et cetera. It's, it's probably a, a natural curiosity for most of our audience. Do you consider yourself a silver or gold miner? So uh, we, we will be primarily a silver miner. El Cubo, um, <laughs> that's a great question because uh, El Cubo, we, we've got more history of the mining and more clarity. You know, we've got a bunch of endeavors records and it's been around a while. It, it is a silver mine with gold. Okay. Uh, Generally, Penguico is that too. But if you look at, the, at some of our, our recent drill results, mm. one could start to scratch their heads and say, well, maybe it's a gold mine with silver. But um, but I, I think that that um, Guanajuato has been famous for silver for a long time. Uh, El Cubo will carry the day. And we, we will be probably a 60% to 40% silver to gold mm, value proposition. Okay, thank you for that. We've had a great question from Victor sent through saying, can you give a more precise estimate here, James, on when you're hiring contractors to try and intersect with the Beta Matai? Um, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know exactly. We've got, we've got a, a drill active right now at Pinguico. We're gonna be getting another drill active at El Cubo because there's a whole bunch of inferred and indicated material that we can, that, that we think quite easily we can transfer into a higher confidence level and have that material available for the mill. Mm -hmm. um, there is, uh, sometimes I put this in, pr in the presentation, it didn't really happen today, there is an old tunnel, there's an old adit, and by old I don't mean 100 years old, I mean 25 years old, okay. um, that, was, that was built, that was tunneled by Fresneo immediately adjacent to us, mm -hmm. and on many of the maps it looks like it comes right across just the corner of that small claim that we've purchased. Mm -hmm. If that is in fact the case, we may we may well be able to drill holes towards uh, Veta Madre on our property from underground. Mm -hmm. Now we've got to do some more work, and I, you know I think I hope everybody that's listening can appreciate we're doing a whole bunch of stuff, and we just can't do everything all at once. So I, I don't have a firm date um, for that, but uh, I'm an exp I'm an explorationist at heart. That that expiration target uh, is something that I want to draw. Great. Well, we're certainly happy that your two-week quarantine expired at that point, but thanks for that, James. Um, uh, Jacques sends in a question around the budget category. Uh, how is the 2021 exploration budget divided between El Cubo and uh, Pinguico? Um, well, right. So, so far, you know, the, the, all of the exploration has been uh, spent at Pinguico. Mm -hmm. um, that will be changing dramatically in the weeks ahead. And um, at the end of the year, I think you'll look back and say, well, we, we spent about 60% of our money at El Cubo. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, Peter asks a really interesting question. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Mark. I mean, just, just, just to clarify that, you know, we've, we've got um, 2 million tons of, indi of combined indicated and, and inferred material. So to yep. be able to, to, to target extensions of that, um, you know, those are, those are res relatively simple targets and we can put material in sight for the mill quite quickly. Thank you for the clarification, James. I appreciate it. Uh, back to Peter, who asks, do you have any sense at this point, James, uh, as to what the mineralization might be like on the 7,000 hectares you picked up near El Cubo? And might it be low or moderate to high grade? Uh, just curious. And he also says, great presentation. I always like to send that feedback. Oh, well, that uh, that is very kind. Um, well, uh, I, think that we, I think that we know that we're in a camp that it is a low sulfidation high grade, narrow vein, epithermal camp. Mm -hmm. I think that extensions of the, the main Veta Madre break can happen anywhere. Uh, I was born in Timmins, and mm -hmm. I can tell you that over the decades that I've been alive and, and, and prior to that, people's opinions about how far you have to be from the major break mm -hmm. uh, or whether you have to be right on it or whether right on it is not helpful, th those change constantly. And if you look at a map of the mining that that has taken place in Guanajuato, mm -hmm. you know one would think that the that the easy exploration is well. Let's just go to Veta Madre, 
But there's two other important systems uh, to the west and to the east. One's called La Luz, one's called Sierra, which is where um, El Cubo is. Mm. You know, the, there may well be other breaks, other, other fault structures, other vein systems. Um, our land package has not been explored in a, in a robust manner. And, uh, you know, we intend to do that, you know, but systematically over time. Okay, I appreciate that very much. Uh, again, to dip back to the uh, how your what your approach is with uh, the Mexican community operating in Mexico, a question comes here that asks: Is there still a union at El Cubo? Yeah, there is, um, and um, we've been we, we've been in, in discussions and negotiations with them prior, even prior to our closing the the agreement with um, with Endeavor. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I, you know, I, I want to say this sensitively, um, but the, the reason why the negotiations are going so well, again, is because I'm not in the room. Hmm. Um, having uh, Hernan and Ramon Davila as our key people to be able to talk about the, the, the w with the union representatives and, mm -hmm. and how they want to, you know, how they view things and how they approach things. Uh, it's been very helpful, very cooperative so far. Great. And I'm hopeful that we will be able to put together something that we can announce over the next month or so, which would be a... Um, um, an agreement of of some kind. I don't want I don't want to discuss it too much, Mark. But that's 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 where we've been going with the with the uh, union representatives. Thank you for that. Great to know. Uh, great segue as well, James. We have a question here that says, "Please tell us about your new director, Ramon Davila." Well, okay. I mean, I, I think I, I mentioned that, um, but uh, Ramon. Well, I'm going to be um, repeating myself. Um, Ramon's awesome. Um, Ten years as chief operating officer at, at First Majestic. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that success has many fathers, and there were lots and lots of smart people, uh, including Keith, who, who ran the company and did many, many great things. But Ramon was the guy on the ground making the, the decisions as chief operating officer, building the company from zero to 12 million ounces of silver production per year and building it from two to 4,000 employees. That, to me, says it all. Mm -hmm. Bit of an MVP. That's, I appreciate that. Absolutely. Uh, speaking of the team, a question comes in that asks very openly, what is the biggest challenge for the team, James? Well, um, in the next three months, it's getting the mill up and running mm -hmm. and making sure that we've got production to be able to put through that mill. Um, everybody knows the, their, uh, their jobs. Everybody knows what they need to do. Um, you know, to circle back to a, a way that you asked the same question a few minutes ago, Mark, um, you know, when I was down there a few weeks ago, uh, I would ask, you know, readily, um, often, every day. So, you know, like, what 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 are we going to do here? And the the guys with the, the El Cubo experience, especially, are very confident. I mean, they just don't see any impediments to, to us getting up and running like that. On a longer term basis, Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think our I think our challenge is to be able to be sustainable, and that means that means sustainable from a social standpoint, uh, mm -hmm. from an environmental standpoint, from a um, community relations kind of standpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, I could go on and on about you know what what we what we are doing and what we will do to be able to have a good dialogue with everybody that's working down there. But the, the biggest single thing is we hire a whole bunch of people from from the neighborhood, from Guanajuato, uh, and from you know. So the, the, our our assets are about ten kilometers to the south. So there's you know small communities that are right next door at Pinguico. Um, about fifty percent of the people who are working at Pinguico live in Calderones, which is okay. a tiny little village, right? Like they're they're right beside us. Hmm. Well, I love the family history too. You talk about uh, father, grandfather. That the, the fact that there's a knowing <coughs> at the operation site is, is uh, I would assume, always an advantage. Uh, let's look ahead a little bit, James. We have a few more moments here for a couple of last questions. Uh, Victor asks: Is Las Torres uh, the next acquisition on the radar? Well, you know, I can't really comment on stuff like that uh, in a public forum. Mm -hmm. um, that would be great. Uh, however, and for for the rest of your uh, listeners who might not know, you know, what Los Torres is, uh, that's the mine immediately adjacent to Pinguico that Fresnillo owns. Um, when I was first there a few years ago, I mean, they, they were, 
you know, actively stockpiling material there. And I, I got a tour of the mill and talked to the, the mill manager. They were adamant that they would be, would be back in production, mm -hmm. um, you know, at, at this time, you know, COVID and other, other problems. I don't know that Las Torres is for sale. Uh, and Fresneo, you know, generally speaking, I mean, if you look at their, the, the long, long history of Fresneo and then w when, when it was within Peñoles, when it was in the corporate umbrella of Peñoles, yes. they don't sell anything, mm -hmm. right? So I, see, yeah. uh, so I think it would be kind of a, a bold statement for me to say, uh, you know, yeah. that, 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 you know, we're going to buy it right away. But certainly yeah. it's right next door. Um, if we can have a, a, a good ongoing dialogue with our mm -hmm. friends at Fresneo, that'd be very helpful. I appreciate that. I mean, we do have an open door for our viewers to speak directly with the thought leaders, but I appreciate the sensitivity around that 100%. Um, let's uh, discuss the name change a little bit. I think it's important, James, as we, as we wind down. <clears throat> That's a big decision for a company. You've shared a little bit about the logic and wisdom as to where, why and how that happened, but to move from Van Gogh to the new company, can you just maybe talk a little bit more about that? So we, uh, we, we're we firm to track the new company. Uh, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, th thanks for the question. I'm happy to do that, especially on, on the eve of us changing the name uh, so uh, quite exciting man there's a, there's a number of different points to it right um, uh, you know number one I can tell you that the, the folks from Guanajuato and the, the the I'm not sure how many the the half of the people who work for us who are graduates of the University of Guanajuato mm -hmm. they're very happy about it I mean they, they see that as a recognition of the, the 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 storied mining history so you know mm -hmm. so that's good um, I mean a, a couple of other points about it though um, so some people have suggested, well, hey, why would you want to change the name for something that, you know, North Americans and Europeans can't pronounce? Um, <laughs> so that's that's an issue. Uh, we have acquired the the domain, uh, Guanajuato, uh, pardon me, uh, gsilver.com. Okay. So anybody that doesn't feel comfortable saying Guanajuato on a regular basis, we are gsilver. Okay. Uh, uh, GSVR is going to be our stock symbol. So I think, you know, that looks like G Silver to me and mm -hmm. you're going to be able to go to our website, gsilver.com. So if you just want to say G Silver, I'm a-okay fine with that. Uh, l l allow me to make just a couple more comments on that, Mark. Sure thing. Um, some people think that, you know, being Guanajuato Silver, that that's kind of um, restrictive maybe of, of growing the company. And I like to, to point out uh, a little company that we've mentioned a couple of times called Fresneo. Yes. Which is named after a, an even smaller town to the north of us that, you know, um, again, North Americans and and, uh, and Europeans have a difficult time mm -hmm. saying, saying Fresnillo, and it usually comes out Fresnillo. Uh, that hasn't stopped that company mm -hmm. from becoming the world's largest silver company. They've Great got a 12 billion pound market cap in London, mm -hmm. right? Um, my, my father was born in Kirkland Lake and my grandfather was a mine foreman in some of the old mines in Kirkland Lake. Well, there's a, a company that's been called Kirkland Lake for a number of years. That hasn't, and, and Kirkland Lake is a tiny little burg, right? Right. Um, uh, you know, that hasn't stopped that company from becoming a major force in gold mining across the, across the, the planet. And when I was younger, mm -hmm. there happened to be a mining company in Canada named after a particularly tiny little place in Quebec. And that company was called Naranda. <laughs> and you don't you don't get much bigger right. than Naranda in the in the mining business. So I think Guanajuato has a lot of strengths. We can be G Silver if you want, um, and we can you know the 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 people behind the company can make it as big and powerful as it wants to be. I appreciate that, James. It's great to hear some of the thought process behind the scenes. And honestly, uh, great kudos to you for honoring where you operate in the Mexican culture at the same time as, as moving forward with rebranding. So I absolutely see the, the beauty in that. Uh, we're going to wrap things up at this point, James. I want to thank you for all the time and openness. We look forward to seeing where the company goes with this great shift. Uh, and I really appreciate your openness with the questions as well. Thank you so much. Thanks for everybody for listening. And uh, Mark, have a great one. We'll, uh, we'll see you tomorrow as Guanajuato Silver.